And I think for people like me who aren't particularly creative, I am fascinated by those who are and how they get to doing what they do. So today it's Penny's turn to talk about her role as an artist and how that came about. And so I'm very, very pleased to welcome Penny and I'm sure it'll be fascinating. I did hear that she was a highly talented little girl whose drawings amazed her teachers. So she's gone from that to what she'll tell us about. And I really look forward to it. Thank you. Welcome, Penny. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, this has uh, been a bit of an um, exercise in uh, working very hard in a very short space of time because I happen to put things off a little bit. Um, and I hadn't, I'd forgotten how long it takes to prepare these things. So I hope you'll bear with me. Um, and I hope I can hand you this sticker. Right. Um, I'll start with um, a statement that accompanies this um, painting, which is uh, Kanamaluka heads, uh, which probably some of you know as uh, tamer heads. Um, and uh, it accompanies uh, an image that I've submitted for a prize. I'm a bit of a prize junkie. I'm always entering them. I don't get in them very often, but I enter lots of them. And uh, um, this is one of those. So the first slide is based on recollections of walking in Tasmania. And I'm going to repeat a bit of what you have said here. Um, on beaches, rocky shorelines, well-worn paths of city margins, dunes, open country and dense bush. Walks that led to musings on ideas that circulate around the representation of land, country, sites, territory and views. How places affect me, their history and the impact of my presence are concurrent thoughts. Now when you enter a prize you often have to put in a statement that accompanies the work and it means you have to, and they give you quite tight word counts quite often. So you have to sort of compress all the ideas into these very short statements. This work draws from <laughs> decorative traditions inspired by the natural environment and motifs include pebbles, glimpses of horizons, watercourses, discarded human belongings, fragments of plants, bone and shell. Um, there's a person I follow on um, Instagram called Dinah Blake who lives on King Island and she's got this wonderful collection of plastic that's been washed up on beaches. Um, when you go on a walk anywhere these days, I think, um, and probably for a very long time, you do find a lot of things that have been left behind by fellow walkers. Um, and these are sort of given the equivalent weight to other more natural things like a yabby cast or a horizon line or a watercourse. The dispersed composition of wheeling spaces and drifting incidents recall the constant re rearrangement of the physical world. The random format also emphasises the role of chance in systems where interrelated components flow together in rhythms of time and ge geology. You will discern several threads to this work's content. Firstly, sources, which encompass interests, inspiration, starting points, antecedents, personal experiences, and secondly, the drawing together of all this through thinking and making processes that lead to the form of the work, always based on technical exploration. I should say now that exploration of watercolour medium has become the principal driver of my practice for the last decade or so. First, I'll take you on a very brief journey through the early years that led me to art school, and then I'll give a short survey of my practice up to the last 10 years. The final part of this talk will then focus on my current preoccupations the media of watercolour and ink. I'm not sure when the concept of art and artist entered my consciousness, but it would almost certainly have been the result of exposure to the ABC children's program, the Argonauts. Probably plenty of people were Argonauts. I was half Palace seven, and I drank up everything that Phidias, who was Geoffrey Smart, had to say about art, and Tom the Naturalist. And uh, you'll see already, I think, connections to that idea of what's encompassed by the naturalist. Um, 
Growing up in, on the northwest coast of Tasmania, there were no opportunities to see visit galleries, and I don't recall being taken to TMAG when visiting grandparents in Hobart or here as a boarder when as a boarder um, in Launceston in my teens. But there were plenty of illustrated books in my home, children's books at home, and I spent <coughs> hours poring over these books long after graduating to chapter books. I also had a grandfather who provided dummy books from his bookstore. Quite magnificent tomes with a photo of the royal family every tenth page or so, <clears throat> and beautiful blank pages for me to fill as I pleased. Then there was the bathroom window, or rather a bank of panes to be inscribed every night at bath time. By the time the last pane was done, the first was misted up again and ready to go. So I think a precocious drawing ability, which incidentally I found embarrassing, was the result of constant practice informed by occasional glimpses of what could be. What could be. Set to draw our farm on one of our Friday afternoon draw art classes, why not every afternoon, I would fret, the contours of the dial ranges flowed naturally from my hand, and I vividly recall the aha moment of working out how to make fence posts and trees perpendicular, which is a bit like that aha moment I think a lot of us remember when we suddenly join up a letter to a word to meaning from text. Um, other children's properly childlike drawings baffled me. Why were people and objects flying through the air? Distant details, impossibly in your face. It didn't occur to me that they were trying to capture the physical experience of being in a place as something mobile, dynamic and evanescent, while I was focused on detached, limited and controlled view as if through a window. This is not to say I was oblivious to my surroundings. Our very small farm was crisscrossed with meandering paths, bush, the Blythe River, fern rim swamps, sooty hollow trees, reed edged dams and little creeks, a paradise that entered the molecules of my bones. I have by a circuitous path come to adopt an approach that encompasses the physicality of those memories, since overlaid by a life of wandering and wandering through landscapes, and through culture and places. Teenage years. I have mentioned an embarrassing talent, but actually it was, was two-edged. Several other artists, um, Ghost Patrol, who you might know, um, who has worked at Scotch recently, and Carmel Dilger, have mentioned how their drawing skills gave them ac an access point to forming friendships when moving to new schools. This was my experience too. Nonetheless, the discovery of the existence of abstract art provided a very useful escape route from, an unwant from unwanted attention paid to what was for me a very special private place. My early encounters with abstract art came in the form of thumbnail sized coloured images in a generalist art book, the name of which I don't recall. I was instantly enthralled, they were about that big, pictures. Um, um, I was in instantly enthralled by the works of Kandinsky, Clay, Miro, Sonia Delaunay and Robert Delaunay. I've no idea why, but perhaps it was because this contact also coincided with an introduction to the magic of repeat printing and lettering, which was part of the then Schools Board art curriculum. This is 1966. The magic achieved through the arrangement of colour, structure and individual elements to create a unified image resonated in the works with these, of these five artists. This response was intensified when I encountered Matisse. I learnt of the artist's connections to, the import, to imported oriental textiles and to the spiritual origins of early abstract painting. Spirituality was of little interest, but I felt great affinity with the unabashed sensuousness of Batisse, and I'm, and I'm still absorbed by the intricacies of textiles. It is inevitable that I constantly reframe my story through knowledge acquired subsequent to the events experienced and new learning. I would like to place this as a process of resonation. Newly acquired vocabulary and concepts generate aha moments and emerge and merge with earlier memories and knowledge, is what I call gel moments, when significance concurs with experience. I have to say this did not happen very often at art school. I found it incredibly difficult to articulate my opinions, if indeed I could settle on one. The usual tension between the acquisition of tech, technical fluency and the emphasis on originality dominated. Legitimate content was a perennial issue. I don't recall terms such as authenticity, agency and authority being explicit issues as they are now, but they lurked among the tussles centred on the legitimacy of abstraction and there were many options for what sort. And realism 
where questions revolved around the perilous cliff face of style. My other impediment to really enjoying art school, the art school experience was a tendency to compare my work with others, which at the time was quite paralysing. In 1971, I began teaching at Ogilvy High School, pretty determined to develop my practice. I moved to Melbourne in 1972 and taught at Brunswick High, where I found the pressure of commuting on top of work left very little time for art making. So I became a postie for a couple of years travelled in Asia, returned to my posty job and eventually got enough work together to feel confident enough to apply with a former fellow student um, art school friend, Ilma Simmel, who's also a Launceston person, for an exhibition at the George Payton Gallery, Melbourne University, which to my amazement was accepted. My preoccupation with formalist, formalist abstraction is apparent in this untitled work from 1907, which as far as I know is the only surviving work from this exhibition. I'm aware that I'm bolting. <laughs> um, the same year I returned to Hobart for a short period where the constraints of my living arrangements, a tiny cottage in North Hobart, meant I had to work, walk on the, work on the floor of our bedroom. Watercolours and pastel paper were the, really the only option. Um, and I'm sorry I don't have um, size on these labels, but going back through these works, <laughs> and with a measuring tape, it was just beyond my time limit. <laughs> um, but this would be that by that. Um, um, these works have never been exhibited, but reviewing them for this talk has made me realise how strongly my current practice is connected to this period. While they differ in that moments of colour are scattered in tightly compressed patches, overlaid and indistinct, to create ragged rhythms and patterns in an uncertain emergent space, some features anticipate my current work. Apart from the obvious connection in the medium and support, the shallow picture plane and a seemingly accidental random placement of detail feel similar. I'll return to these connections later. There are probably, probably 30 or 40 of these tucked away somewhere in the plan drawer. Um, okay, um, now. A lot of life happened in the next few years. Marriage to my partner, David Marsden, two daughters and several new um, homes, including several years spent on Flinders Island, is where these next two works came from. These works on paper, tiny, um, were more structured. Spaces are split and folded. They possibly reflect the rhythms of the of details in the landscape there. And the palette is very Flinders Island during a dry spell but these works do not make conscious reference to the immediate visible world. And there's a little digression here, um, working, uh, painting with a small child underfoot, like a, a four-year-old, um, um, is fairly perilous, particularly one who doesn't sleep in the daytime. Um, but I sort of negotiated this by um, allowing her to help me make the works. So there's, there's a lot of underpainting, if you like, that's contrib been contributed to these works by um, um, Gillian, and then I have reworked into them, which is not unprecedented. There's quite a few artists who are doing that as we speak. Um, <laughs> um, okay. Um, I saw these works as having more affinity with music. I mean this in the sense that they are organised patterns of marks, passages of colour and texture, analogous to patterns of audible textures, colours and rhythms, which we understand as music. Matthew Collings draws par this parallel in his discussion of Kandinsky's painting with a black arch in his program, The Rules of Abstraction. I don't know if anyone's looked at that, but it's a really terrific. Um, it's on, available on YouTube. Um, after a brief st stint of living in Devonport, we settled in Launceston in 1984. Um, and early works from this period continue with this above theme in several, with several important differences. Um, you can see that the compositions are more tightly structured, the shapes pinned down by bold and assertive linear art outlines and rhythms, the rhythms more sedate. Um, I, I should also add that um, David and I had parallel practice and there are often crossovers um, and people couldn't even tell our works apart quite often, which was a bit annoying. But um, um, <laughs> I showed David this slide last night 
he thought it was his. <laughs> no, it's definitely mine. <laughs> um, but we did um, eventually, our pathways did eventually diverge in, that, in our drawing, uh, in our art practice anyway. Um, by this time, I was teaching at what was then the TCA to become TSIT and later still University of Tasmania. This was a period of great vitality in the art school and I found uh, contact with several textile artists, Margaret Ainsco, John Corbett and Greg Leong, particularly stimulating. Now, this is one of my works, but I'd say it owes a hell of a lot to Margaret Ainsco. I don't know if people know her work. There is one in the collection here. Um, uh, it's actually a big, a big um, panel of um, wool blanketing and I've sort of pulled, pulled, scratched away at the surface of, of um, the blanketing to pull off that, that sort of those fibres and then roll them into balls and then stuck them back on the work. Um, which I think, I must have signed them on actually. I think that work's lost, I'm not, I don't know where it is. Um, and now it's decided to stall on me. Where's our Oh, it has moved. It's, oh, it was just slow. <laughs> um, uh, okay. Now, where am I? Um, and this, this uh, uh, actually incorporated several textile approaches into a Master of Fine Art degree that I took, undertook during the, um, the 90s. This is from 1999. These are actually, um, that's actually an encaustic, red encaustic painted panel. And then this little kind of shower of, Dolly's clothes, almost like a comet, um, didn't quite capture, I think, with hindsight what I was, the work was about, which was called Ponds of Blood, and it was made during the period. There, there are times when my work gets these very quite, quite direct political um, moments in them, and I think this is the only one like that that I'm showing, um, but um, that suicide bombs were a, um, a terrible issue at this time. And um, I can remember a international student talking about the experience of being in ponds of blood. We would say pools of blood, and I thought that was a very arresting sort of image, and, and um, of all the way of sort of alluding to that horrible period. I guess. Moving on. Um, the sculpture department was not without influence. Um, and uh, I got a lot of ideas for installation generated by, uh, by contact with David Hamilton. And here, uh, David Marsden and I undertook a very ambitious art and public building project for the Centre for Precision Technology in, during this period. Um, this is actually um, a big 3D work, which is installed in a barrel vault bolt area um, and it's made of, you can see that it's um, aluminium welding rods form the, um, the verticals and the, it's based on the, uh, a diagram of a veranda net and I'm working with, we're working with the idea of ideas sort of filtering into this, this strange net and some of them being caught in the, in the upper panels which is like the, the upper part of the veranda. Um, it was, in, it was very, very ambitious in that it was a very complex shape that had to fit into a barrel vault um, <clears throat> and was really brought, brought to fruition by the use of some very um, good technical assistance. Um, a very good pers a person who, who was very, very good at um, CAD design and <clears throat> another very good welder. <clears throat> and I don't know if it's still there. It was last time we looked, but that was about 10 years ago. Uh, that's the thing about art and public buildings. They don't necessarily stay where they were for very long. Um, there followed a period of text-based work, again the result of contact with ideas gleaned through teaching and a stimulating art forum program. I used very intense, layer, dense layers of text based on poetry since destroyed to overwhelm the surfaces that in a way, to me now, suggest a prison. Um, <clears throat> at the time, I think I saw these nets rather as language being a filter, a form of filter. Um, 
At the time, there was much discussion in the world of cultural studies about the power of language to shape experience, perception, opinion, and by extension, the control of the allocation of power, or politics, if you like. Um, um, and I find these works, looking back at them, I find, that, oh, they, they're, they're a bit creepy. <laughs> um, uh, and these far from um, optimistic works eventually evolved to become abstract, um, or more abstract. If it's quite slow in its response. I don't know whether to hit it again or not. Come on. What does one do when this happens? Call the technical support. He's probably, he's probably um, <laughs> relieved. <laughs> I wonder why that's happened. I'll try going backwards and then going forwards again. That might. <laughs> it went backwards. Okay, we'll try it again. Let's we'll see if we can persuade it to keep moving. Just um, Here we go. I think it's right. Someone knew what to do. Okay. Many years earlier, I had observed a particular, particularly sensitive use of ink by a student in a life drawing class. We we decided just to use the this this what this stopped working, <laughs> but it's all right. Okay. <laughs> Plan B works. Sorry, I was just getting old. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, now, this, uh, many years earlier, I'd observed a particularly sensitive use of ink by a student in a life drawing class. Her control of the flow of ink from the brush onto a moist surface had captivated me. It was about 15 years later when I was working with repeated rows of these repeated rows on fine Chinese paper as an extension of the text-based work that I recalled her approach. <coughs> um, repetition and arbitrary rules were increasingly significant to my process. This, also, this work also has a distinct feeling of knitting about it, a craft that can produce an endless length of fabric and be put down at a moment's notice to take up a more urgent task. This fit perfectly with the necessity to negotiate an increasingly hectic family life, teaching and study. Um. Um, I utilised several techniques and approaches to physical space that derive from contact. Oh, I'll go back again. Sorry. Right. Um, um, I utilised several techniques and approaches to physical space that derive from contact with sculpture, textile, and installation for a number of immersive, immersive works. The most successful of which were. Uh, go back one. This, back is, one. this is the one we want. Oh, sorry. No. Sorry, I'm confusing. Oh. Slow, isn't it? <laughs> what if it's back fist flat? Okay. Thank you. Um, and this was an entry in the Hutchins Prize. Now, um, that was, they were very strict, that was in the, exhibited in the, in the Long Gallery and they had very strict rules about um, um, uh, how work could be uh, fixed to the wall um, and so I had to get someone to build a false frame 
uh, and then the work was pinned to that. So it's, it's sort of just sort of plugged into the space, jammed between the floor and the ceiling, and uh, that's that's how it worked. Uh, it was very undermined by the placement of another work of art just under the windowsill, which didn't uh, really <laughs> afford do very much for it. But um, that was really the first of the really um, immersive. There were several others, but that was probably the first that I was really happy with. And this one, um, titled Excess, which I remember Deb Mailer here in the audience writing a terrific essay for. It, this work screams obsessiveness, if I agree, um, it, but it does seem to shift between gentle whispering spaces and an urgent, unintelligible muttering. Uh, I can't believe I did that, so, so much time. Um, other installations which um, refer directly to human interactions with natural processes included outlines. Come on. Doesn't really want to move. Right. Um, this was an exhibition of lithos, and I forgot to load up the lipho, um and suspended pods. <clears throat> and the work was about the containments of seeds. So basically, I had um, threads from the ceiling. I had these little objects tied to them, and uh, relied a lot on light to um, get shadows forming on the on the wall behind. And then uh, colour circles. Um, which is about the breeding, harvesting, and display of flowers. And the eventual demise. Um, these exhibitions co uh, coincided with a series of um, collaborations between Sue Henderson, David Marsden, and myself, uh, and we called ourselves as a group Art Three. Um, Sue and I already had a history of collaboration with um, flood markers, unknown man holding up his hand level with the 1929 flood level. Um, and uh, as you can see, the, um, uh, there are the rows, the repeated rows that I've done of marks, and then these blobby uh, lichen-like shapes that Sue has done. Um, and uh, the Dry Street House, in which we experimented with reversible paste-ups, a technique we learned from Xiao Hai, a Singaporean student, in which we reference flood records, accretions of mould and layers of sedimentation. So basically, we took over most of Jane's kitchen and her bathroom to produce this weird and wonderful. Um, uh, and then it became almost, it, it almost became a, a performance, um, well, it did really become a performance uh, um, moment when uh, people got into the swing of things and started to use the bathroom in lots of imaginative ways. Um, um, and so between us, Sue and I had um, uh, covered many walls and surfaces within the universe precinct and beyond. And when we became Art 3, we cannibalised a great deal of this work for subsequent exhibitions. <coughs> I have mentioned the importance of contact with ideas generated by others to the evolution of our practice, which I guess is pretty obvious really. Teaching resources, students, art forums, visiting artists and conferences propelled my practice along several pathways. Opportunities to exhibit and to curate ex uh, exhibitions in artist-run spaces such as Cockatoo, Poimena and the university galleries also played their part. That's another one. That one is from Space Antics, which was in, in um, Burnie. Um, um, there were many requests when I was teaching um, in the 90s for instruction in the art of watercolour, a technique which, in spite of my early work with the medium, I nevertheless felt very inadequate to teach. Uh, so I contacted the expert, Tony Smybert, who took a short three-hour class for us. He very generously crammed a wealth of information into that class, which I subsequently used for the next 20 years or so. Tony had demonstrated a very open-ended experimental approach to comparing papers and techniques, <laughs> which most students loved, and their experiences reached, their experiments enriched my knowledge as much as Tony's had. As I approached retirement from teaching, another shaping 
force began to shift the direction of my practice when I discovered the dynamism available in the Daniel Smith watercolour colours, uh, particularly the granulation range, which opened up endless realms of experimentation and discovery as I applied the Smybert um, approach. Also, once I retired, I had far more time to explore the round, land around me, and my thinking um, about the representation of landscape was especially stimulated by the writings of Robert McFarland. I find his musings on the history of the paths he has walked, his relationship with places, and especially how places change him in his book, The Old Ways, especially relatable and provocative. Around this time, I remember seeing at Sawtooth Gallery some dramatic photos of ice-covered water taken at Tasmania's, in Tasmania's Central Highlands. And I'm sorry to say I don't recall the artist's name or precise location. And I wondered if I could capture or register this phenomenon with watercolour and paper. And here is uh, an early example which um, I made at Crabtree. <clears throat> I didn't realise at the time how lucky I was. Perfecting the technique of frost capture in multiple locations here in Tasmania and interstate is endlessly fascinating, if often frustrating. Most of my winter activities are determined now by my consultations, consultations with the bomb site, watching out for frosts. These slides give some indication of the processes and outcomes. So I'll just run you through how um, that one. Um, so there, I've got a sheet of glass set up on a very, very flat surface um, at a friend's shack. Um, that's then painted with um, Daniel Smith paints, uh, in this case, um, Luna Black, uh, which granulates beautifully. Um, it's been left overnight. That particular night it snowed, but it did frost before it snowed. There we are. We've picked up the whole thing, glass and all. It scrapes the snow off. And there's the finished work. And very intriguingly, I realised when I was scraping the snow off that there was um, the remains of a bee um, down in that corner. And I think it had, um, I think what was registered there were its death throes, I think, because it was all hollowed out. And I think something had attacked it and it had fought life and death and had not survived. And its insides had been taken out. And I was just left with this little carapace and this interesting little bunch of flowers in the bottom corner of the painting. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the process. Um, at the same time, I read, uh, read earlier watercolour experiments instigated by um, Tony Smyre at class. The effects produced by granulating colours often bore an uncanny re resemblance to landscape fe features, such as fields of alluvial sand plus the odd beach find, including, uh, this is an example of what on Flinders Island is called Bunker's Ear. Um, um, these are fossilised remains of the little bits of calcium, I think they're made of, that float around in the canals of an, a, a, a whale's ear to keep it, help it, we've all got them, to keep its balance. And um, from the remains of things that you find in in, in particularly inland on Flinders Island, uh, there's a long, long history of mass strandings because you often find carpets of these. Uh, these were discovered in the 60s when <clears throat> they were first um, turning what was swampland into farmland um, and they were using big drag lines to create uh, channels and these were being unearthed and everyone had one on their, on their kitchen window so, um, but this culminated in a series of work uh, titled Behind, um, Inside the Whale's Ear. Um, so you can see here in this work the, the idea of um, fields of sand being moved by the wind and perhaps by the action of waves and these actually very dense black objects um, and the idea that everything kind of gets rearranged all the time. Um, Where am I? Okay. Coupled with scouting around with potential frost gathering sites, I found myself paying much greater attention to details in the environment. 
I've since become absorbed by the idea of conveying a sense of moving through whirling spaces, interspersed with unpredictable resting point details. This endeavour has been framed by habit of walking and as a car passenger, often in search of frost. Examining ideas about what landscape encompasses and its representation is a constant thought line on these, outline, on these outings. In representation inevitably omits detail, knowledge, history. I can't tell you how many times I recognise a detail from a current painting in a, on a subsequent walk. So a lot of things that I pick up, um, uh, little details I pick up, I've done pre-consciously. Um, I've noticed how patterns of thinking and conversation affect perception, particularly on car journeys. Um, the, now there's something out of order here. Uh, the Central Highland route never fails to enthrall with its twists and turns that reveal one extraordinary vista after another. Intermittent conversation turns my eye inwards and I miss all things or recall other absent things. I've come to see the negative unpainted shapes in my work as voids that represent the shape of lost or absent details, the overlooked or the disappeared. Um, so you see um, in this one the voids the absent things are very prominent. A cousin who is a dress designer commented that she would like to wear this work if it was a fabric, and indeed the resemblance of much of my work to fabric designs is undeniable. I take this as a compliment. There are many examples of artists who have designed fabrics derived from aspects of the natural world, including Sonia Delaunay, who worked with colour phenomena, Miro and Drysdale, both of whom use landscape details as starting points to their design. In this work, um, Next work, weather events. A whirling field of scatter, scattered with crystalline details recalls the sumptuous ball gown by Chanel as much as the semi-precious ge geological sample from the collections here. Um, and this is where um, uh, it's quite a good one for seeing how the um, uh, watercolour watercolor techniques um, affect or are used. Um, I'll often for instance, where those blues are, I'll paint that area in blue, allow it to dry, and then I'll put a pool of water over it, and then I'll just drizzle some of the black, um, uh, um, lunar black, Daniel Smith granulating paint, and it just kind of goes, Poof. you don't know what's going to happen, but it's usually pretty exciting. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so... My current interest in dispersed compositions derived from the paradoxically energetic negative space found in many fabric designs, um, as much as from fields of unpredictable watercolour granulation. The constant rearrangement of details on a sandy shore by the action of breaking waves or wind, the changing contours of the tidal estuary, the reshaping of the crest of a mountain by a cornice of snow are the results of a process of are the results of processes that involve a degree of randomness. My compositions are intended to recall the constant rearrangement of the physical world. Unpredictable frost etchings are sometimes paired <coughs> with um, randomly composed panels in which rice is thrown to establish the placement of details. <coughs> In this example, I wanted to evoke the experience of walking. Oh yes, we on the right one. Yes, on, we, experience of walking on a frosty boardwalk. Landscape features shrouded in fogs, ever-changing mudflats, and details within. So that we've got the frost, frost edge on one side, and then the more conventionally painted area on the other side. Finally. Um, the random format also reflects the role of chance in systems where interrelated components flow together in time and geography. For this example, northeast with the river walks, I have made many drawings of the Nanking night heron, some from direct observation at Kuichi Park and some from Google. There is a nod in the direction of Japanese fabric in the simple bird motif set in a flattened background. Other motifs include fragments of plants and discarded human belongings, yabby casts and feathers or seemingly suspended in the reflected sky on the river. The placement of each detail was established by the throw of grains of rice. 
The random composition recalls the constant rearrangement of the physical world by the haphazard processes of natural and human generated events. In this case, the action of water movement in a modified tidal estuary and the comings and goings of migratory birds. So that's the end, and I think you can see perhaps that I'm acknowledging that those little kids who had things flying through the air, the pictures were actually um, just as valid as what I was doing at the time. Thank you. Thank you. Frost paintings where you had the glass sheets. Did you put paper on top of the glass or you just put pigment? No, no, sorry, that the paper is put on the glass and then painted on. Um, and uh, sometimes I, I use a very weak solution of um, um, methyl cellulose glue to hold it in place. Other times I've got this giant rolling pin which I use to flatten it all out. And um, you've got freezing hands and you kind of, yeah, but it's, um, um, it's, it's, it's incredibly rewarding and incredibly frustrating because you can go to all that work and the next day go, There's, there was no frost, or yeah, or it rained, or yeah. yeah. Do, you wet the, do you wet the paper? Yes. Oh, not always. Not always. Um, you get different effects. Um, I haven't shown ones here, but I have, have done them where I'm actually painting on the paper while the frost is happening. So everything's kind of congealing as, as I'm applying the paint and you get amazing effects that way too. Yeah. And one other, well, got you. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you throw the rice, is that literally what you do? You just get. Yeah, I drop it. I go. Drop it, I drop right. it. I don't. I, well, I, I used to use. I used to use um, um, salt. Grab big lumps of salt, um, and uh, they they were too bouncy. <laughs> I discovered. So now I use rice. And the thing about the rice is it also gives you a direction, um, sort of fall on a particular angle. And so if I'm doing something with a par uh, sort of a. Uh, a line wanting to go that direction, I'll make the line. You know, I'll get that gives it a direction as well. I have to say it's called curated randomising um, because sometimes you go that can't happen, and you just go and flick it <laughs> and give it another go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, with your with your frost. Um, Preparation. Have you used any metals like aluminium or things like that? Yeah, I, I have. Um, uh, the thing about the reason I choose glass is because it stays rigid. Um, it's it's part of the thing is keep, get, keeping the whole thing absolutely flat, um, and you don't want the you don't want the paint to all pool overnight and end up in one spot. And um, so I have ended up. <clears throat> I mean, I could use metal sitting on a sheet of glass, and in, in a way that might be more more portable, but um, no, I don't think I'd achieve much that way actually, because I've still got to take the sheet of glass with me in the car, and yeah, some of them are big sheets. Yeah. In, in the paint, you'll buy aluminium powders and any other metals. You know, like if there'll be a reaction with it. Yeah. With that, yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking outside the box. Yeah, it. no, that's exactly um, um, what happens with um, watercolours. It's it's um, the, the watercolours that. <coughs> uh, uh, their sort of volatility when I use them this way is the result of chemistry, it's a result of um, um, gravity and it's temperature and um, I guess physics too. So there's all these things that are, are making, making, making the whole thing come together. Yeah. Um, in, <clears throat> from my perspective they're very unpredictable. I'm sure a scientist would go about it in a much more um, systematic way with their observations. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to thank you very much for the talk. I found it fascinating um, because I often look at works and installations I find probably the most challenging of all actually. and. Um, try and work out how the artist has come to that way of presentation. And to have some of these things explained is really, really beneficial. I think I understand Miro a lot more now yes. than I did. 
And uh, I also think it's such a valid way to look at the world, that, that you're taking a world that's unpredictable and chaotic and not only showing that in your final product, but really through the process yeah. of getting to that product. It's very, very fascinating. And as an ex-teacher, retired teacher, I'm also really intrigued by the notion that by praising a child and uh, <laughs> hoping you're going to direct them in a certain way, you actually shove them in the opposite <laughs> direction. <laughs> I'm just wondering, have you ever returned to representational? Oh, I do uh, sometimes. I do sometimes. Um, and just to, to see if I can still do it. <laughs> right, yeah. right. It's a whole yeah. different skill. Yeah. Yeah, I'll probably mm. get tempted after I go next door and have a look at the, the archies to do a portrait of my husband. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very, very much. That was um, quite a different talk in some ways. It was for the practitioner. <laughs> Thanks for having me. And um, Penny was our second last speaker for the year. Next month we have Donald Pulford, and Donald is quite a character. And I think just between you and me, I can tell you that you'll find it most amusing, not even when he means to be amusing, he can be <laughs> amusing. And uh, he's talking about his life, which has been very full, um, theatrically, and how he's worked across the world, uh, ranging from sort of accidentally finding himself on the West End to working for one of the um, Borgias in Italy who still managed to be able, <laughs> following family tradition, um, he, he was asked how he was going to get funding for a particular theatrical occasion in southern Italy and he said, that is the family business. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's some great stories, I think you'll enjoy that. And thank you very much for coming. And once again, thank you so much, Penny. I found that really very, very fascinating. Thank you. And I'd like to thank Malcolm too for yes. coping so well with the stress.